could walk along a stream and be exultant over a great blue heron, or struggle with the death of a friend, or who can delve into the problems and joys of parenthood. But none of these poems, with their technical varieties and perfections, prepare us for this southern lad entering the soul of a 13th century Islamic mystic poet and make him speak in a language so American and so 21st century that one can feel as if the very soul of this country not only had hope for true enlightenment, enlightenment but that the map to where one could go to get there was already drawn and there were several interstates that led to the very spot. <laughs> it is rare indeed to have a translator so gifted as Coleman, who can suppress his ego so thoroughly that one feels that Coleman and Rumi are not the same person, but that Rumi is willing to speak through him. His equals are Edward Fitzgerald with the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, Seamus Haney with his Irish version of Beowulf, and the team of translators that brought about the King James version of the Bible. <laughs> Tonight, we have not just a night of poetry. <laughs> Is he acting up over there? There will be penance later. <laughs> but a concert where the slow musical bass of Colvin's southern speech gets married to the cello and the harp of Barry and Shelley Phillips, whose own serious musical careers have led them to perform from coast to coast, mixing the works of Celtic shaker and southern shake note music so that they, care, they are carriers of a wide range of American musical experience that is both secular and religious. Their CD with Coleman of Rumi's poetry makes one feel as if this Sufi poet is applying for permanent American citizenship. <laughs> so therefore, it is my pleasure to welcome back Coleman Barks and for the first time, Barry and Shelley Phillips. Sugar cane. 
in love with the one to whom every that belongs. What was said to the rose that made it open was said to me here in my chest. So these poems were spoken spontaneously 700 years ago in the Persian by Jalaluddin Rumi. As part of his work with the Dervish learning community about the size of this uh, audience. And they, the work of that community was the work of opening the heart and of exploring what it is that they called union and to fiercely seek out and try to say the truth and to celebrate and lament the glory and the difficulty of being in a human incarnation. To do that good work, they use poetry and stories and jokes and silence and fasting and feasting and football. They used anything that human beings do, no matter how trivial or scandalous, as a lens to look into the growth of the soul. Big questions would arise in the community like, what is the purpose of desire? Do I see a hand in the back? No. <laughs> Lou is going to explain that later. <laughs> or what is the nature of a dream or a song? Or where can we find the balance between surrender and discipline? That's a tough one. What are the architectures we can imagine that will remind us of ways to, of being, of old and new ways of being together? So these big questions would arise. And they wouldn't necessarily find answers. They knew that the answers came in dreams, or the answers came in music, or in movement. And uh, they just waited for the, the answers to come. They also were practical people. They had um, practical decisions to make, like, should I go to law school, or what's for lunch? Or where did I leave my shoes? <laughs> and uh, they weren't, they, they had day jobs. They uh, were hat makers and weavers and masons and book binders and tailors. And uh, they, so they weren't renunciants. They were affirmative creators. And uh, some call them Sufis. I just call, they're on the path of the way of love. <laughs> I, one time, a couple of years ago, in the early 90s, I got together with two or three other people, and uh, we had the dervishes come and turn at the uh, World Congress Center in, in uh, Atlanta. And uh, we got about 1,500 people to come and watch them. And we, we didn't lose but $3,000 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> It takes a lot to fly the turkey. So, but uh, the, the, the uh, or just to fly from Washington. But there were a lot of they, we. Uh, but uh, we, um, the guy that, who was the lineal descendant of R Ron Rumi, uh, Jalaluddin Chalabi, sat me down. And he says, "Now, what religion are you?" <laughs> and I just threw up my hand. He says, "Good." Love is the religion, and the universe is the book. The, your life as you're leading is your sacred text. That'll save us a lot of printing costs. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rumi is a poet of deep grief, as well as the ecstatic um, abundance. And here is a poem in which he talks about the opening that comes with grief.
Great. This is Great Forest Pacific. A friend of his named Saladin. Um, and when he died, um, Rumi wrote this poem.
by Saladin's shop suddenly. I hear the beauty in the fire of gold being hammered. Gold and God. As gold gets hammered, God becomes the sheer gold leaf lighting this gold beater's face and in his eyes as he works. One night, a man was crying, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising, until a cynic said, so, I have heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer for that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep where he dreamed he saw Hitler, the guide of souls, in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I've never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. One night a man was crying. One night a woman was crying. Every now and then with these poems of Rumi, I'm going to read one of my own. Um, maybe a mistake, <laughs> but I've made mistakes before. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a poem. Um, I have two sons, and uh, when they went off to college, uh, I, I wrote this poem sort of um, celebrating <laughs> or, or grieving, you know, but both, maybe. Uh, they're, they're going off and my not being a father anymore. I was the first in my family to be, to get divorced and also the first not to take my children to church. In the South, that's a big deal. My brother's a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> so anyway, but I, so I didn't take them to church, but I did sing them. Uh, these old shake note hymns that these two know so well, little Appalachian hymns that they do the shake notes of, do, re, mi, fa, so, la. So we were, I had at that time, a, um, or a little before that time, uh, a wife <laughs> who was getting a, a, a degree in folklore at the University of North Carolina. And uh, her advisor was Dan Patterson, and Dan and I and, and a bunch of others would go up to these little towns in, uh, up in the North Carolina mountains and, and sing these old hymns with these, uh, uh, these primitive Baptists that would sit in a square, you know, and, and there wasn't any, any piano anywhere near, uh, or any music, I mean, musical instruments. They might be back at the cabin, I guess. But yeah. Uh, but um, so we'd go up there, and I stood close enough to Raymond Hamrick so that I, I learned the bass part. 
and because uh, I can't read the notes. And so I would periodically sing them to my children, the bass parts of these old things, as I guess about the only spiritual instruction they got. Uh, so that's part of this poem. It's called New Year's Day Now. And it's about my, one of my sons lying on the couch there, and, uh, and, and when I'm sitting there watching a tele, you know, football game on New Year's Day, <clears throat> and he's uh, sleeping in all his, his New Year's Eve finery on the couch. Fiesta Bowl on low. My son lying here on the couch on the dad pillow he made for me in the seventh grade. Now a sophomore at Georgia Southern, driving back later today, he sleeps with his white top hat over his face. I'm a dancing fool. <laughs> 20 years ago, half the form he sleeps within came out of nowhere with a million micro lemmings who all died but one, piercer of membrane specially picked to start a brain-making egg drop soup <laughs> that stirred two sun and moon centers for a new painted sky in the tiniest ballroom imaginable. <laughs> now he's rousing six feet long, turning on his side. Now he's gone. I sound low-key, but this is the way I howl an old hymn. And the plaintive bass drum a charm for accepting what happens and a stubborn question. Say, why in the valley of death should I weep or alone in the wilderness roam? There's no one to worry about waking with my singing. I have loved them, those two boys, so well that they've left. We're after the fact now, out in nowhere again. We're I. And I am a line of music, wriggling along like water, wanting to be ocean. The cedars of Lebanon bow at his feet. The air is perfumed with his breath. Singing and talking, one vibrates with the other. Vapor mist going up this way. Cloud come back around down. The old fossil law singers would not commit to words until they ran through the notes in broken lines of rain, the reverse of me rocking my babies to all verses of Samantha or David's lamentation, who now in a shower somewhere murmur tunes they have no lyrics for. Allah be la, so do me, so me, me. I never took them to church or told them stories about David or Samuel or Jesus, but they move like fish, or tadpole radios in the mud, flat on their backs on a roof, or breezing by. Maybe any motion is holy music, not only theirs. Remember how it went, then forget. Sliding, forget more. Sliding air in the throat, this song. It seems so soon to quit any shred of unfinished existence. Ah, so, so me. That somehow is unbelievably over. The growing of the corn. Over and over, our watery bodies keep moving. Hands give, eyes weep, feet walk. Shoulders swim, the chest hopes, the genitals wait, and the thighs, their small stroke dancing work of balancing and lifting the thighs, slow move, a big river-like forgiveness, we can jump in. I and my strong boys, now men. Some songs don't ever get completely sung. They're sung by the blood, inside creeks and rocks and air, in some cellular Beulah land. The harmonizing water sings them. Adidos, so 
But for you, he says, they are a danger because they can lead to ecstatic self-hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> he just nailed me to the floor, man. <clears throat> but there are worse ways to go. <laughs> um, here's the, another side of Ruby, the antidote for that um, drenched, drowned, sweetness place. And it's, this is the severe Ruby. Harsh. He says, sometimes I have to put a little vinegar with my honey to make the ecstasy, a little scolding with my love to make the ecstasy more familiar. <laughs> my dad used to take a morning tonic of a, a spoonful of honey and then a spoonful of vinegar. You ever heard of that? Yeah. I never have tried it. There may be some connection between Alabama and the Persian. <laughs> they know the same things. So here's a, a sequence of severe this Remy. There's courage involved if you want to become truth. There is a broken open place in a lover. Where? Are those qualities of bravery and sharp compassion in this group? What's the use of old and frozen thought? I want a howling hurt. This is not a treasury where gold is stored. This is for copper. We alchemists look for talent that can heat up and change. Lukewarm won't do. Half-hearted holding back. Well enough getting by? Not here. Who makes these changes? I shoot an arrow right, it lands left. I ride after a deer and find myself chased by a hog. Not often now. <laughs> I plot to get what I want and end up in prison. I dig pits to trap others and fall in. I should be suspicious of what I want. <laughs> On resurrection day, your body testifies against you. Think of that. <laughs> Your hand says I stole money. Your lips, I said meanness. Your feet, I went where I shouldn't. Your genitals, me too. <laughs> they will make your brain sound hypocritical. Bodies doing speak openly now without your saying a word. As the students walking behind the teacher says, this one knows more clearly than I the way. When school and mosque and minaret get torn down, then dervishes can begin their community. Not until faithfulness turns to betrayal, and betrayal into trust, can any human being become part of the truth. When school and mosque and minaret get torn down, then dervishes can begin their community. Not until faithfulness turns to betrayal and betrayal into trust can any human being become part of the truth. I love this silence. Please don't. No, please don't. <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything about it. 
<laughs> but here's a poem of my own called Purry. You can tell it's mine because it mentions the internet. <laughs> The internet says science is not sure how cats purr. <laughs> Probably a vibration of the whole larynx, unlike what we do when we talk. Less likely a blood vessel moving across the chest wall. As a child, I tried to make every cat I met purr. That was one of the early miracles the stroking to perfection. Sorry. <laughs> Here's something I've never heard. A feline purrs in two conditions, when deeply content and when mortally wounded, to calm themselves, readying for the death opening. The low frequency evidently helps to strengthen bones and heal damaged organs. Say poetry is a human purr, vessel mooring in the chest, a closed mouth refuge, the feel of a glide through dying. One winter morning on a sunny chair inside this only body, a far off inboard motorboat sings. The empty room. Um, and one more of my own. I was a. Uh, I taught in universities poetry and um, modern American literature for 34 years, <clears throat> and then I retired five years ago, and uh, I wrote, you know, they have those gatherings of the English department, and I wrote something for that, <laughs> you know, it wasn't any good, <laughs> but those occasional things, you know, it was better than what they wrote for me, <laughs> it, was, it was bad, and then uh, here's, my, here's my real uh, retirement poem. <coughs> And I'm afraid it's true. It's called the Final Final. <laughs> I missed giving my final final exam. I slept through it. <laughs> the alarm didn't sound or I turned it off in my sleep. I'm buying a new clock. But maybe it's perfect this way. They wrote me such letters. I'll give them all A's. <laughs> But that moment will not come back no matter how I call, how for it to weep. This morning will not come back this afternoon. But the letters I have from them are better than the finals they might have written. Maybe not. This class really was the best I ever, and I regret, I regret. Though this way may be truly right, it hurts so, missing the saying goodbye to each as they come up my best, my last. I did that last lecture well enough a week ago Thursday. That was good, I guess. And they wouldn't have written what they did if I had been there today. Unconsciously, I gave them my absence. As these last 11 years, my teacher has consciously given me his absence, presence. Whatever, however he is with me, now he's dead. Problem is, is. While we're in these aging shapes to show up for class, bright eyes, bright ears, seems like so much else in my life, the waking late and not making the formal gathering and this regret for sleeping through. I cannot believe I missed the final final, the predictable conclusion to my legend in the English department. <laughs> the secretaries loved it. <laughs> I can't believe it, and I won't say I'm sorry. I am sorry. Like my mother used to call unreliable hired help, you can't count on him, he's just sorry. <laughs> you never know if he'll show up. 
I'm so sorry, I won't say I'm sorry. <laughs> and actually it gives me a chance to give 40 A's, which out of some arrogant, ungenerous, grading attitude I would not have done, which now I do. With an iron whang of the grades only shoot door in the back of an academic hall and an illegal pull of the chapel bell. I really did that. <laughs> do you reckon I'll sleep through my death? Another pull. Sleep through Resurrection Day, another. And have to do this whole jabbering career again, pull. Or will I get to go on to some other plane where there's no such thing as dreamless sleep and discipline and drinking too much the night before and faulty clocks and forgetfulness and the frustration of saying anything in front of groups and no such a thing as regret and the satisfaction of a job well done and no more ceremonial walk through doors and no way to miss the living moments and no way to try to write them right. <laughs> or say there's nothing after my, now. Then this lovely bunch of young people talking and laughing and writing me letters, forgiving me even, straggling out of that room made sacred by our presences and attention were gone when I arrived at 10.45. <laughs> you created quite a stir around here, says someone on the hall bench. I bet. I heard them say you've used up your poetic license. <laughs> this is how death might surprise, as the thing undone irremediably missed out on. You round a corner in the backyard party with your friends is breaking up. Where have you been? Alone? asleep. If I lived with someone, I might have been jogged awake, reminded, but I still don't want to live with anyone. <laughs> I'm unrepentantly, sufficiently, some would say terribly alone. Look at me and be frightened. <laughs> I'm not pouring the last of the love and wakefulness you're given, which is every moment, but more so some than others. Emptying out is the point. In time, over time, be early. <laughs> Back to the enlightened mind. <laughs> I obviously am not. Uh, here's a... Ruby talks easily about the mystery and the fluidity of identity. And here's one about that. Just you might call it parapsychology. He just thinks it's the way things are. We sit in this courtyard, you and I, two forms, shadow outlines with one soul, bird sound, leaf moving, early evening star, fragrant damp, and the sweet sickle curve of moon, you and I, in a round, unselled, idling, in the garden beauty detail, the raucous parrots laugh, and we laugh inside laughter, the two of us on a bench in Konya, and yet, amazingly, in Khorasan and Iraq as well, friends abiding this form, yet also in another outside of time, you and I. stories are to human growth as facts are to science. That is, they are that 
basic. The Hasidic masters in 18th century Russia says that God created the world because he loves stories. So that your problem is just to be your story. Unfold your myth. And uh, Rumi says that stories are like the water that you heat for the bath. They clean you and they um, refresh you for whatever's coming next. Well, here's a story that Ruby told about three travelers that met. Three devout men of different religions fall in together by chance traveling. They stop at a caravanserai where the host brings as a gift a sweet dessert, some taste of God's nearness. This is how people out in the country serve strangers. The Jew and the Christian are full, but the Muslim has been fasting all day. The two say, let's save it for tomorrow. The one, no, let's save self-denial for tomorrow. You want it all for yourself. Divide it into three parts, and each can do as he wants. Ah, but Muhammad said not to share. That was about dividing yourself between sensuality and the soul. You must belong to one or the other. But finally, for some reason, he gives in. I'll do it your way. They refrain from tasting. They sleep and then wake and dress themselves to begin morning devotions. Christian, Jew, Muslim, shaman, Zoroastrian, stone, ground, mountain, river. Each has a secret way of being with the mystery, unique and not to be judged. This subject never ends. Three friends in a grand morning mood. Let us tell what dreams we had last night, and whoever has had the deepest dream gets the halwa. Agreed. The Jewish man begins the wanderings of his soul. Moses met me on the road. I followed him to Sinai, an opening door, light within light. Mount Sinai and Moses and I emerged in an exploding splendor, the unity of the prophets. This is a true dream. Many Jews have such. Then the Christian sighs. Christ took me in his arms to the fourth heaven, a pure, vast region I cannot say. His is also deep, the Muslim, Muhammad came and told me where you two had gone. <laughs> you rat, she said, you've been left behind. You may as well get up and eat something. <laughs> no, laughed the Christian and the Jew. How could I disobey such glory? <laughs> Would you not do as Moses and Jesus suggest? You're right, they say. Yours is the truest dream, because it had immediate effect in your waking life. What matters is how quickly you do what your soul directs. Here's a poem that just consists of about 10 metaphors, all of them about the same thing which is that mystery that the, that the, with the moth flying into the flame is, uh, that's surrender. It's 
knotted, neck broken, tells you the same. A candle as it diminishes, explains. Gathering more and more is not the way. Burn, become light and heat and help, melt. The ocean sits in the sand, letting its lap fill with pearls and shells, and then empty. A bitter salt taste hums this. The rose purifies its face, drops the soft petals, and points. Wine abandons thousands of famous names, the vintage years and delightful bouquets, to run wild and anonymous through your brain. <laughs> Love that. The flute closes its eyes and gives its lips to Hamza's emptiness. Everything begs with the silent rocks for you to be flung out like light over this plane, the presence of Shams. Shams was his dad. Ruby knew that uh, jokes were important because there was a slight shift in consciousness whenever a human being is about to hear a joke. So, Najuli knows that it's very important to get regular exercise. He says, my mother, at 60 years old, began walking five miles a day, and now she's 90, and we have no idea where she is. <laughs> Here's the statistic that most automobile accidents occur within one mile of your own home. So he moves. <laughs> Nazarene carries a door with him wherever he goes. It's a security measure, he's explaining. <laughs> the only entrance to my house is through this door. <laughs> so I keep a close eye on it. <laughs> Najardine is walking into town, he sees a wall covered with bullseyes and each one in different heights and all over the wall. And each one has a perfect shot right in the center. A young man with a rifle is standing nearby. How did you become such a perfect marksman? He says, easy. I just fired first and then drew circles. <laughs> that way I get a bullseye every time. Najardine reflects that the young man's answer has some deception in it, but that it solves the problem that we all have of being off-center. <laughs> Nazarene is drunk. He comes out of the tavern at 4 a.m., begins aimlessly wandering the streets. Police stop him and say, Nazarene, why are you out walking the streets at this hour of the night? He says, sir, if I knew the answer to that question, I would have been home hours ago. <laughs> Here's one that's not funny. <laughs> or nobody else has left. I think it's pretty good. Nazarene has a magic wand. He waves it and uh, conjures up a patent office with a man behind the desk. And he says, I'd like to get a patent on this magic wand. The man says, we don't give patents on that new age paraphernalia. <laughs> so he waves his wand, and the man disappears. <laughs> Notre Dame is behind in his funding. So he goes to the wealthy part of town and uh, says, 
knocks on the door and says, I, I, can, I can fix anything. I'm very good. I'm very quick. The man said, well, this is good because I've got a porch around the back that I'd like for you to paint with this deck paint. So he takes it around and comes back in about 10 minutes. So says, I'm through. Uh, the man gives him $50. I said, that's amazing how quick you painted that porch. He said, he's walking away. He turns around and he says, but my good man, I have to tell you, that's not a porch. That's a Ferrari. <laughs> servicing the animals in his farmyard, the chickens and the ducks and the geese and, and uh, sheep, <laughs> goose and the dog. And he comes out and he says, I did not pay such an exorbitant price for you to have you make a chaos of my farm. And besides, if you don't quit this relentless sexual activity, you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> Najardine looks out the window the next day and the rooster is dead. Uh, the buzzer is circling now. He goes out to lecture the corpse one last time. I told you this would happen. I told The rooster opens one eye. Shh. When, when you're romancing a buzzer, you have to play it there. Well. Badly. But that didn't matter. 
And so anyway, uh, we were driving off and, and we saw a clump of, of the opponents shouting, we won, we won. So she jumps up on the convertible, you know, standing on the seat with her hands on the rent shield, and she says what she says in this poem. In the glory of the gloaming green soccer field, her team, the Gladiators, is losing 10 to zip. She never loses interest in the roughhouse one-on-one -on -one that comes every half a minute. She sticks her leg in danger and comes out the other side running. Later, a clump of opponents on the street is chanting, we want, we want, we She stands up on the convertible seat holding to the windshield, we lost, we lost, big time, 10 to nothing, we lost, we lost, fist pumping air. The other team quiet, abashed, chastened, good losers, don't laugh last. They laugh continuously. <laughs> All the way home, so glad. And since it's football season, I'll, I'll do another thing. Uh, it's called an opening game day traffic. This is in Athens, Georgia, you know, where football is a religious experience. Uh, she explains tackle football. You pass the ball between your legs, you go hurt somebody, then you start over. You pass the ball between your legs, you go hurt somebody, then you start over. When everybody is hurt, the game ends because the people in the stands don't want to get hurt. They just like to see others. Two-hand touch is better. I'll read you one more. <laughs> she asked me, did I have poems for children? They were doing poetry. And would I write one that had her name in it? I don't think I do have any poems second graders would listen to. Mine are too old or not lively enough. Or they might mention something that they're not supposed to hear about. Like the girl Claudia, 10, watching television who said, Mom, I'm not old enough to watch this. <laughs> but now maybe something, this could turn into something they might like because I am remembering Claudia's younger brother, Rob, went to a museum and saw Lucy, the name scientists have for the early almost human ape, ape woman they found and reconstructed how she looked millions of years ago. She's hairy and naked and stooped over with her hairy breast hanging down and she's carrying a bone for a tool. And she's about 50 feet high on the museum wall. And Rob sees her and can't stop looking. And he keeps saying as they're walking around other places, I can't stop thinking about losing the ape woman, Mom. I can't get her out of my mind. <laughs> then he's quiet for a long time. And then he says, I bet she was pretty for her time. <laughs> children sing on the school bus. It has the F word in it. I beep it. Every time it comes up, I beep it. Do you know what it means? Yeah, sex. Some other older boys must have taught it to them. He's quiet. Don't you think they must have? Okay, okay. I wrote that song, but I, keep, I beep the F word when I hear it. Rob's a songwriter and a film critic. Once they were in a movie lobby in the popcorn line, Rob was fiddling with himself in the pants area. <laughs> Honey, do you need to go to the bathroom? No, I'm just getting my penis ready for the movie. <laughs> the teenage couple behind them collapsed with laughter. <laughs> or maybe the most telling cinematic observation I've ever heard. <laughs> I get to writing poems for the beloved. <laughs>
so there she is. And, man, but here's, here's one, too. I used to, I grew up on the, right by the Tennessee River, and there was a place every spring where I'd go down, and, and the violets would bloom there, and come back every year, and it was so beautiful there and green, and it was like a secret, sacred place for me. And um, so this is sort of to honor that. It's called Silo Spring Violets. And we, I've never heard this song. They're going to do it. It's a Shaker song, isn't it? Swedish, are you? Slender ash trees by the rooted river spidery bank edge. I fold in with edible lavender butterflies, each next each, in a wandering myth of body and crows. I do not know who I am. Forever will. To invite friends to see a silo of memory whose house is an empty plot between an uncovered well and this other cylinder of poured concrete. We go clump together as a kind of a way for a while then take our single stems aloof. Listening, listening to music in the dark, I feel a great sphere of violets and water and grass riding in the night between us and the moon. It cannot be looked at directly. It's more elusive than even our fluttering lives that leave a silky damp in the air.
You recognize this as a variation on the old prayer, but at least that I grew up saying, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. Plus mom and dad and her. No, it has to be. And if I die before I wake, pray the Lord. But in my family, my mother wouldn't say that. That was too gruesome to fall. So she just went and left it out. And just said, bless mom and dad and her in bits. And grandma and Aunt Pearl just went on forever. <laughs> This is Remy's version of that. Now I lay me down to stay awake. Pray the Lord my soul to take into your wakefulness so that I can get this one bit of wisdom clear. Grace comes to forgive and then forgive again. Now I lay me down to stay awake. Pray the Lord my soul to take into your wakefulness so that I can get this one bit of wisdom clear. Grace comes to forgive and then forgive again. This last one we're going to do is a poem that Rumi spoke at the end of a night when they had stayed up saying that remembrance of God they call Zikr and uh, telling stories and jokes and uh, making up spontaneous poems. And at the end of the sun is coming up after this all night session. He says, tries to say what the state of awareness that they're in is and he can't say it. He can only say what it's not. The only, it's maybe a state of awareness that we don't have a word for in English. He calls it splendor or majesty. It may be what the inside of a cathedral is uh, that kingdom within that, that Jesus mentioned. Uh, at any rate, he says it so. Amazingly, he says it's, there's something in us that is prior to the existence of the universe and the cause of it. Take that, <laughs> scientists. <laughs> wow. Thank you for your beautiful quality of listening. This we have now is not imagination. This is not grief or joy, not a judging state, or an elation, or sadness. Those come and go. This is the presence that doesn't It's dawn, Hussam. Here in the splendor of Carl, inside the friend, in the simple truth of what Halaj said, what else could human beings want? When grapes turn to wine, they're wanting this. When the night sky pours by, it's really a crowd of beggars and they all want some of this. This that we are now. Creating the body cell by cell like bees building a honeycomb. The universe and the human body grew from this. Not this from the universe and the human body. This we have now is not imagination. This is not grief or joy, not a judging state or an elation or a sadness. Those come and go. This is the presence that does it.
It's gone, Toussaint. What else could you be? For those of you who follow our poster, it's at the end. So let me give you a little preview of what, what, what's going to be happening next semester, and then we'll ask uh, Coleman some questions. Um,